Hello friend, this is Brent Winfield of Advent Message Ministry. I welcome you to another edition of I Didn't Know That. I pray that you're being blessed by these video letters. If you have questions or comments, I invite you to send me an email. My email address is brent at adventmessage.com and you should also visit the website adventmessage.com for more information. You know, for many years now, a question is being asked, where is the true Word of God? With many Bible versions proliferating the landscape of Christianity, many people are confused as to which is the true Word of God. Up until the late 1800s, there was generally speaking only one Bible, the authorized version. There had been others, but the translation instituted by King James I in 1603 and published in 1611 AD had become known not just in England but throughout the entire world as the authorized version. It is a historical fact that the King James Version Bible had become known as the authorized version due to its universal acceptance among Christians of the then known world and not due to some proclamation from King James himself. First and above all in importance, it must be remembered that the Bible is a spiritual book. If we divorce this fact from our minds, it will be impossible to arrive at a valid conclusion. Now what do I mean by this? Let me explain. First God himself directed the creation of this Bible. The scripture that quickly comes to mind is 2 Peter 1, 19-21. We have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Peter states that the writers of scripture did not write under their own power, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Friend, God wants us to see that he had his hand in this from the very beginning. The words of those original autographs were not just the thoughts of God, but his very words, which now brings to mind the question, why did God inspire his word perfectly? Obviously the answer comes back, so that man could have every word of God pure, complete, trustworthy, and without error. Would God give those precious words only to those early Bible writers and then lose them in history, dilute them with false teachings, and then lock them up in a vault where few could see them and none could trust them? Were those perfectly inspired words written only for a people in a certain period of time and not written also for our society? Why provide those people who lived around the time of Christ with a perfect book and then give us 2,000 years later a book that is at only at best a shadow of truth? This is inconsistent with God's nature. Wouldn't it make sense for God to be able to write the Bible perfectly in the first place and then perfectly preserve it throughout history? Bear in mind, friend, that about 1700 years transpired from the writing of the oldest Old Testament book to the closing of the New Testament in 90 AD. Now let's look at what each of the Bible says about uh, such a thing happening. Psalms 12, 67. The words of the Lord are pure words, of silver tried on a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Notice it says, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The Bible, God's word, says that God will preserve his words. Verse 6 mentions words of the Lord. And the them of verse 7 is referring to those words. Apparently, the all-powerful God of creation will not just preserve his thoughts or ideas, but he will preserve his very words. Now, is he capable of doing that? Well, let's see what he has to say in Jeremiah 32, 17 and 27. Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. 
Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Is a miracle too hard for the God of miracles? Was the creation too hard for God? Was the flood too hard for God? Was the parting of the Red Sea too hard for God? Was the 40 years of manna too hard for God? Was the collection of the 66 books of the Bible written over a period of 1700 years too hard for God? Was the overcoming of human nature of sinful writers too hard for God? Is preserving of words too hard for God? Jesus Christ himself spake in Matthew 24, 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass. We who are so far removed from the New Testament times need his every perfect word far more than Matthew, Luke, John, or Peter, or the others who saw Jesus Christ in the flesh. You see, they had their memories. They had his touch still on their brow. They had his words still ringing in their ears. All we have is the book. All we have is the words bound between those covers. It's essential that they be his every word, for they are all we have. So now we see it is important to any seeker of truth to always keep in mind that the Bible is different from all of the books in that God had his hand in it. It's a spiritual book. Anyone undertaking a study of the evidence of the Bible who does not take this into consideration cannot possibly arrive at a correct conclusion. Therefore, we now come to ground rule number one. It's always to be remembered that the Bible is a spiritual book which God exerted spirit supernatural force to conceive. It's reasonable to assume that he could exert that same supernatural force to preserve it. This brings us to our next logical step. If God was active in the conception and preservation of the Bible, then the supreme negative force in the world must be active against it. This book has an adversary. Satan is against it. The Bible is a tangible item. Like most books, it's printed on paper with ink. And as I mentioned before, it must be remembered that it is a spiritual book in which God has had a positive and an active part. It must also be remembered that there exists in the world an evil power, Satan. One general truth that we all know concerning Satan is that he at one time had a position in heaven. Iniquity was found in him and he was cast out. What was his offense? He wanted to be worshipped as God. Remember that, my friend. The Bible records in Isaiah 14, 13, 14, for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. Someone once said that Satan has an eye problem. He wanted to be worshipped as God. Satan has not changed his goals. He still desires to be worshipped as God. To be worshipped as God, he must imitate God. Satan is a great counterfeiter. From beginning to end, the Bible records Satan's constant effort to imitate and replace God. Monasteries, mosques, huge cathedrals cover the globe as a testimony to the devil's religious fervor and as clear evidence of his ability to extract worship from his followers. Now, if you may call him Lucifer, Baal, Astaroth, Mary, or any other name, but if you allow him the liberty, he will take a portion of truth and twist it in such a deceitfully convincing way that if possible, he will deceive the very elect. If Satan can eliminate the Bible, he can break our lifeline to heaven. If he can only get us to doubt its accuracy, he can successfully foil God's every attempt to reach us. The Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth, but every truth he leads us to will be in the Holy Bible. If Satan is going to be consistent with his nature, he must attack the Bible, the Word of God. Our second rule then to bear in mind is, Satan desires to be worshipped. He tries to counterfeit God's actions and will definitely be actively involved in attempting to destroy God's Word, or at least our confidence in God's Word. He can do this by seeking to replace God's one true holy word with his own versions 
or as I like to call them, Satan's perversions. Friend, next week we'll take a closer look at how the devil is successfully hoodwinking millions of Christians with fake Bibles. Until then, may God bless you. Remember, God loves you. He really does love you. This is Brent Winfield. I'll see you next week.